Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave us a rating and review. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. All right, let's get to it. I um I got to spend some time this weekend at Comic Arts Brooklyn, this uh, one-day festival, three days of panels, but really one day of, of uh tabletop cartoonist selling stuff um and i got to catch up with some of my past guests which was a lot of fun uh, like bob sikoriak creota wilberg mike tisserand um but i also got to see some potential new guests people i've talked to about doing a show kind of firmed up plans with them um including mark newgarden and paul karasik who have this wonderful new book out from fanographics called how to read nancy um which is bigger than just how to read the comic strip Nancy. Uh, and I also got to see Chris Ware, who I've been um, in conversation with about getting together for a conversation, and he seemed enthused about doing that sometime in the next, uh, well, sometime in 2018. We'll see where it all goes. Um, for all the fun of doing that, unfortunately, there's also uh, bills that need to be paid. So I am off to Toronto and Ottawa this week for business uh, with no podcast prospects awaiting me i'm i'm doing a panel or i'm actually giving a keynote presentation in toronto for a, a pharmaceutical outsourcing event on wednesday and then um going to health canada so i can attend a clarification session about some new proposed legislation and um and that is what i do when i'm not doing this it's um it's a balancing act as you know but that's what I have to do. Um, I did ask a couple of my Canadian pals if they had any suggestions for things that I can do uh, in the few hours that I'm going to have to kill in Ottawa. Uh, and amazingly, they both replied, bring a book. So I'm I'm not looking forward to that part of the trip. Still, new city, place I've never been. Uh, somebody else is paying the bills. So it'll be fine. But that's what this gig is. Um the other downside of doing that is that I'm actually going to have to miss uh, this week's, well, a reading and Q&A with this week's guest, uh, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I'll tell you about the guest right now, uh, because he was just a goddamn delight to, to get together with. Um, see, Ohio State Press uh, reached out a couple of months ago after they heard this year's Philip Lopate episode and said, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, as you'll guess, if you like essay collections by old literary guys we've got a great one coming out from nicholas del banco want to talk to him um again they put it in better terms than that but that's that's really what it was about nicholas has this new essay collection it's from osu's uh mad river imprint and it's called curiouser and curiouser essays and it is just a treasure he's well when i got the book and started reading more about him i realized he's had such a a long and, and amazing career that I was pretty sure we'd have a great conversation. The implication of what I just said, of course, is that I had not actually read any of Nicholas's work before this pitch. Uh, so I read Curiouser and Curiouser, loved it. Uh, then I went back to read his most recent novel, The Years, uh, as well as two of his previous nonfiction books, Lastingness, uh, which is about artists who are still productive in old age and the art of youth about artists who died before they were 40 and um, 
So I've developed a very stilted, late career impression of Nicholas Del Banco, and that sort of colors this entire conversation. Still, I enjoyed all four of the books. I think I like the new essay collection, Curiouser and Curiouser the most. It uh, what starts off with this wonderful piece about restoring uh, Nicholas's father-in-law's Stradivarius cello, um, which was apparently an article once upon a time. He expanded it into a full book, but this is the original essay that it was it was built around. Um, it's it's a fantastic piece of work. There's also pieces on uh, museum going. Uh, Nicholas's work revising an early trilogy into a single volume and kind of rewriting it in the process, which we talk about, um, as well as an autobiographical sketch he had to do, and then two 15-year-later updates, like one 15 years, another 15 years after that, um, which are very interesting. They're all wonderful pieces. The center of the book is an essay I don't want to give away anything about. Um, it is the eponymous uh, uh essay of the, the book, Curiouser and Curiouser, and the color of the cover may also be a hint as to, to what the essay is about. It's um, it's really amazing piece of work. So anyway, Nicholas, as I was saying, is going to be doing a reading and a Q&A this week. And that's at, if you're listening to this in relatively close to real time, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, November 15th, 2017. Uh, it'll be at Book Culture on West 112th Street in New York City. Um, if you're listening to this weeks or years after I posted it, then you missed it. Also, uh, tell my wife I loved her. Anyway, uh, that's a bad joke. Uh, I got together with Nicholas last week at his apartment in, in New York City to record, and um, and something funny happened. And this is going to be one of those Gil asides. You can skip ahead a couple of minutes uh, to get to the show itself, because this is me talking me here. Um, we had this great conversation, and you'll get to hear that, but... The way we were sitting in his study, Nicholas's writing desk was in my field of vision the whole time, just over his shoulder. Small desk, couple of drawers, lamp, laptop. I just kept looking at it and thinking how nice it would be to have a space with no clutter where the only purpose would be to write. Now, I've, I've joked about like getting one of those Muji huts and... and putting that outside my house and having that as like my writing space, but that would be insane. Um, although when I recorded with Barry Blitt up in Connecticut, uh, he had a place, he had Arthur Miller's old house and it had this writing shed where Arthur Miller did his, his writing. But yeah, see the thing about, uh, a space with no clutter is that for me, that's a conceptual problem and, and not a physical one. Uh, because like having a laptop or any internet enabled device on the the desk would just honestly keep me from getting any work done. I would just be too busy checking my email or doing work or or just finding a way to waste time. Uh, the last time I got any real fiction writing done, I guess 2014, um, it was writing longhand on these these big pads and occasionally typing it into the computer, printing out clean copies, marking those up, typing everything back in. So what I'm saying is I kind of found myself thinking while well, I'm talking to this guy who's been writing for over 50 years, has 30 books done, um, maybe I just need a little writing desk with, with no internet device on it, and that'll be the place I go every morning to, to try to write for an hour or so. So now I'm looking at reconfiguring my, my library slash office, getting rid of half of the sectional sofa, sectional sofa, um, getting a, a smallish desk that I could put under a window. And just uh, putting a lamp and a pad and a pen, of course. And um, I will let you know how that goes. I know you guys have heard me prattle on self-pityingly about this for years. And, of course, New Year is coming, resolution, blah, blah, blah. But maybe that's what I need, just a, a space where I'm not connected to stuff, where I can kind of just focus on uh, uh, blackening the blank page, as Nicholas is going to say during our show. Now, for caveats, uh, I set up the mics on a coffee table, kind of low. Nicholas wasn't too close to them, so I had to, to pump up the gain. Picks up a lot of noise. I had to filter that stuff out. So there's going to be some audio artifacts and a little bit of a, a echo to the whole thing. But otherwise, that's, uh, that's all I got to say. Now, the bio from Curiouser and Curiouser is kind of brief. So here's one adapted from Nicholas's 2015 novel, The Years. 
Nicholas Del Banco is the recently retired Robert Frost Distinguished University Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Michigan. He has published 30 books of fiction and nonfiction. His most recent novels are The Years and The Count of Concord. His most recent works of nonfiction are Lastingness, The Art of Old Age, and The Art of Youth, Crane, Carrington, Gershwin, and The Nature of First Acts. His most recent book is Curiouser and Curiouser, Essays. As editor, he has compiled the work of, among others, John Gardner and Bernard Malamud. The long-term director of the MFA program, as well as the Hopwood Arts program at the University of Michigan, he has served as chair of the fiction panel for the National Book Awards, received a Guggenheim Fellowship, and twice a National Endowment of the Arts Writing Fellowship. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Nicholas Del Banco. You have a new essay collection. In it, you mentioned that you did, um, I think you published 10 books in your first 14 years. Right. You're only up to 30 now. Does it mean you've been slacking in the past <laughs> 30, 35 years or not? Um, what a good question. I think, in fact, most people construe me to be uh, um, ludicrously productive. Yeah. And um, I guess the not quite so generous uh, way of describing it would be obsessively at work. Uh, I do believe that there should not be a long interval between uh, one's labors, and so I have indeed attained 30 books uh, under my own name and uh, edited maybe a dozen others. Um, that strikes me as a reasonable, not unreasonable, number of uh, titles. I studied, as as you know, with John Updike, who was incomparably more prolix and prolific than I, Joyce Carol Oates, Paul Theroux. There are many um, practicing authors, Stephen King, who, um, who simply operate under the old Grub Street assumption that you, you know, you work and you keep working and you keep working and if you do that 30 titles over 50 plus years of publication is a modest uh, mm -hmm. achievement rather than um, an excessive one. And how has that work changed both in terms of your practice <clears throat> and in terms of publishing and bringing something into print? Well the question of publishing and bringing something into print is a separate one yeah. and um, has more to do with the world of publishing than with my private practice. Um, like most habits, it's harder to break than it was to make. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I established the habit early on of getting up early in the morning and getting to work. The um, it's, it's a rare day that I'm not at my desk by six, and it's usually well before that. And so when the workaday world comes to call or the telephone rings or I have to go to an office, as I did for the years I was teaching, um, meaning 10 or 11 o'clock, I would have been finished with my day's labor. There's a story I, I, I love to tell, um, and he loved to tell it on himself, from the great English novelist Anthony Trollope, whom you uh, probably know was prodigiously productive. Um, I think damn close to 90 books uh, in, in total. But like many other uh, English authors of the 19th century, he needed to make a living and have a day job, as do you and I. Um, and he worked at the post office. The, uh, uh, I mean, he wasn't a mailman exactly. He's the guy who figured out how to deliver the London Mail on time and read their still farm more competent at doing so than, than are we uh, on this side of the Atlantic. But at any rate, he showed up at his job, his civil service job, at 9 o'clock in the morning. So from 5 to 9, he wrote. Um, and he records this in his autobiography, so it's at least partly true. Uh, he said one morning at quarter to 9, he finished a novel. So he started another. As long as he had another 15 minutes. He had another 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, he did you know, tell this tale on himself with a certain uh, 
degree of tongue in cheek, and it, it went a good distance to wrecking his reputation, <laughs> because um, shortly thereafter, you know, the, the notion of the romantic artist entered in, and words from the wind, and inspiration, and all of that. And the idea of this drudge, you know, prescribing regularity as not a druggist, um, undermined uh, what people now recognize was, was, was Trollope's authentic artistic excellence. Um, but I have followed his lead to some degree. I do believe that the definition of a writer is one who writes. It's not um, that you're a writer doing three and a half years while you put nothing on paper and ruminate about what comes next. There are many authors who've done that, and many admirable ones. I just don't happen to be of that party. Is that sort of the first principle from when you were teaching? It's something you'd instruct? Um, yes. Uh, I, I don't believe that there's any particular habit that you know, I would prescribe, uh, again, as my druggist, I'm using that uh, terminology in your presence. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, I've just told you mine. I, I'm no good by the time of day that we're now talking. Uh, I've had lunch. I'm looking forward to dinner. I wouldn't want to be writing um, this, this night. I work in the early mornings. There are many others who work late at night uh, into the early mornings. So it doesn't matter really at Tinker's Dam whether it's from 5 to 9 in the morning or from 9 to 5 uh, in, in the evening, or whether it's every second Thursday all day long. What does matter, it seems to me, is that you establish a habit and a routine procedure. Because more often than not, this thing called inspiration comes to you when you are at the desk. Uh, and it's, um, it's just a way of getting into a rhythm where the juices more or less predictably flow. So yes, I do tell my students to get into a habit. What habit it is, is their business, not mine. Were you the sort to carry a notebook in case you had ideas away from the desk? Uh, not particularly, uh, and largely because my handwriting is, is, uh, is <laughs> impossible to parse. No stranger can do so, and I find myself puzzled often, as not by what I've written down. I do have a good memory, and so I, I tend to remember things that I've, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things within the, the collection is the essay on revising one of your earlier, three of your mm -hmm. earlier works mm -hmm. into a, a single one. Um, how much of a spirit of revision do you have towards your, your past work? Or I, how much of that is the, this could be made better versus the, I can't believe I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> You're referring to an essay called uh, My Old Young Books, um, which came about essentially at the invitation of a publisher that I've learned to admire called Dolky Archive Press. They flatteringly asked me to uh, reprint um, three novels that I wrote in the late 1970s. Uh, one was called Possession in 1977. The next was Sherbrooke's in 1978. And the third was uh, called Stillness that came out in 1980. Um, they did pretty well, those books. It's, it's, it's not boastful. It's accurate to say that a lot of people paid uh, attention to them, and they had a shelf life, uh, and were reprinted, and so on and so forth. But in the way of my usual flesh, anyway, um, they disappeared with time and uh, became artifacts of an increasingly distant past. So when uh, this fellow said, uh, let's reprint it, I, I was pleased. But I thought, because I'd always considered those three books to be part of a single volume, that a, a single entity, not a, not a trilogy in the, in the technical sense of you know, one book following on another, but a, a tripartite uh, single text, I thought, let me do it as a single volume rather than as uh, three separate things. And that entailed a whole series of, of, of necessary changes. Um, in the most obvious instance, um, when you write book two or book three, you can't assume that each of your potential readers will have read the precedent texts, 
So you need to have some kind of information in book two or book three that tells you what happened before. Yeah. And uh, in a single volume, those are redundancies. Uh, so I edited them out. And um, then there became some slightly less obvious uh, things that had to happen, uh, largely uh, linguistic or, or, or in the larger sense rhetorical. Um, I had I'd, I'd been sort of you know, practicing my scales back then, and I uh, found that I was a little too loud uh, in, 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 my, in my older age. By the time I sat down to revise those books, I was roughly twice the age of the fellow who wrote them. And um, that entailed, uh, as I suggested, a certain rhetorical shift. I mean, the younger Del Banco really loved to write, as it were, at the top of his lungs. Uh, the older uh, Del Banco uh, believes to a degree that less is more. I admire power and reserve right now rather than young. Um, power on display, uh, even presuming I had any. Um, so I cut back uh, quite a bit. Uh, there seemed a lot of linguistic or rhetorical excess in those books. And by the time I'd done that, <clears throat> the whole was considerably shorter than the sum of the previous parts. But that's essentially it. Um, I wrote those things long before the advent of the computer, so there weren't any Word documents to, to fiddle with. I, in effect, I had to copy edit the whole uh, enterprise from uh, photographic reproductions, and that meant really that I changed more or less every page, mm -hmm. um, which was an interesting exercise. Um, but uh, it's not one I necessarily commend uh, or would make a habit out of. Well, that's what I wondered. It, yeah. Did it strike you as, boy, you know, I really should go back to X, Y, or Z also? And the other question is, um, did you notice that, was there a point of recognizing that shift you had made over the course of your writing career? Or was it really the looking back at these three and thinking, I'm a very different writer than I was then. Were you cognizant, I guess, of it as it developed? Um, this attaches to the first question you asked me about the rate of production. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'd published seven novels, I think, by... Let me think about this, to be precise. Um, by the time I was 33. Um, and I'd sort of done so almost on automatic pilot. I don't mean by that that I wasn't conscious of serving out an apprenticeship and um, trying to uh, learn the tricks of the trade, but I, I wrote really at some speed. And um, the difference between my early career and that of most other authors is that my juvenilia found its way into print as opposed to uh, the back of the shelf. Um, or the desk drawer, drawer that's locked, yeah. yes. There's a wonderful story that Jeffrey Wolf tells about his own first effort when he was still in college. Um, he was a student of uh, the great critic R.P. Blackmore at Princeton. And um, Blackmore, uh, Jeffrey said to him as, uh, in the senior year, said, you know, I've just finished a novel and I'd like a little advice as to where to publish it. I mean, I don't need you to tell me anything about what's wrong or right with the book, because I'm quite satisfied with it, but I'm rather curious about for our Strauss and Drew, or whether it should be Alfred Knopf. I've heard good things about him. <laughs> and uh, why don't you look at the thing and, and give me some advice? Blackmore took it. He heard nothing from him. <clears throat> and many months went by, and Wolf was about to graduate, and he invited Blackmore out to lunch uh, and repeated the question. Uh, Blackmore was a prodigious drinker and three martinis in. He said something to the effect of, yes, you wanted advice on your novel. He said, take that manuscript and have one of those real top desks, don't you? Put it in a drawer and lock the drawer. 
Just, and he says, and then, so you're not tempted to open it again. Throw away the key. Just, and because you might want to have the key remade or open it again, just burn the desk. <laughs> <laughs> So that burn the desk um, is, uh, is also advice that I tend to give to my students, uh, though perhaps a little more gently. Um, no one gave me that advice, and I, so I published all my early books. Um, Are the but, ones you're ashamed, not ashamed of, but you're no, embarrassed they, by? No, actually they strike me as the record of a, of a pretty gifted child who was, mm -hmm. who was uh, ambitious in ways that I, I still applaud. Um, but they don't seem to me to be books that I would literally wish to exhume and rewrite mm -hmm. uh, or improve uh, sufficiently so that I'd now be proud of them. By the time of the Sherbrooke's trilogy, my eighth, ninth, and tenth novels, uh, I did feel that I had cut my eye teeth and that I was past the apprentice stage. And so they seemed to me to be worth revisiting. Whether I've written anything else that I would like to revisit in that way is another question. One is, of course, always dissatisfied with X, Y, and Z uh, in a text and wishes you could take it back or put it in or whatever. But by and large, I think one should leave well enough alone and say, well, this was the production of that author at that age and stage. So revision and vision are um, hand are, are paired, but but not always hand in glove. Mm -hmm. And that sense of continuity, that recognition that you're now this author and not that author. Well, Again, that, finding reserve as opposed to display. Right. Was that a uh, you know we leave our fingerprints all over every page, and a writer's work is more like his or her own other work than it is that of anyone else. So though I think, and I think perhaps accurately, that the author of my first novel is not the same as the author of my most recent novel, the distance is more manifest to me than it might be to a reader. Sure. Um, there have been famous instances of, of this revisionist impulse in print. Probably the most famous is, is that of Henry James, who in 1909 uh, reissued all his novels uh, in what's called the New York edition. Um, he was hoping that he could put them together and make money off of the republished collective whole. I think on balance he did the work a disservice. Uh, what did result, uh, because he was one of the smartest novelists that ever lived, uh, what did result from it is a series of splendid introductions, uh, reconsiderations of the book, um, and those uh, have been republished and collected. But the novels themselves didn't necessarily get improved just because he rewrote them. Mm -hmm. and the through line, we'll put it, of the, the last several books of yours, both essays and, mm -hmm. and the last novel that you published in, in the years. Um, it's all age. Mortality and age is that, well, the dominant topic for all of our lives, of course, but exactly one so. that you sort of consciously approaching, I guess, as you're getting into your late 60s and early 70s, were you thinking, this is where I'm, I'm my mentor? You, you know, your question is... is is a keen one, uh, and I'm inclined to ask you uh, the same thing. I mean, to what degree do you now uh, think of yourself with reference to your historical past and your projected future? Um, we are, uh, though we're not of the same age, uh, necessarily more aware of this than we were when we construed ourselves to be immortal and young. Um, I don't know that I ever sat down and said, hmm, the next three books I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, old age or youth. In fact, uh, just to continue with this perhaps interminable history, um, after my 10th novel had appeared um, in 1980, uh, a friend of mine said to me, you know, 
there's not much point in just continuing to write novels. Uh, you, you don't want to have 50 of them and nothing else. Uh, why don't you try your hand at some other stuff? Uh, for instance, you're a teacher. Why don't you talk about things you teach? Um, or uh, books that you <clears throat> have read with profit. Um, and I took his advice uh, and pretty much since then have tried to alternate between fiction and nonfiction. I think probably in the last 20, 25 years, I've routinely gone from publishing a work of fiction to a work of nonfiction. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, two of my nonfiction books uh, have addressed this subject uh, head on. One is called Lasting is the Art of Old Age, which was about a series of painters, writers, and musicians who at least maintained and in some cases advanced their art past the age of 70 which, for obvious reasons, is a subject of incremental interest to me. Of course. <laughs> um, and then, uh, perversely enough, perhaps, I went to uh, the art of youth uh, and talked about um, the work of some you know, greatly gifted people who didn't make it uh, to the age of 40, who are, in fact, the majority in, in, in the history of art, <clears throat> in part because actuarial tables have changed and Part because so many were killed in wars or uh, plagues or what have you. But um, I did write two nonfiction books about this subject uh, The Art of Old Age and The uh, Art of Youth. That probably has exhausted my interest in it. I'm not going to write a book about middle age and, and its various <laughs> I was sort of hoping. I'm, I'm right at 46. I'm right in the middle there. Well, you are. But your, but, your most but, recent novel also was two people in the, their 60s reconnecting right. after a long gap. And, exactly so. Yeah. And uh, it's called The Years, and it remains, I guess, on, on topic, if not point. Um, yes, time and generations and generation in the larger sense um, have become, I suppose, my subjects. That is something that, that one acquires after a number of books and a number of years, a sense of the through line. I mean, I couldn't have told you that this would be the case mm -hmm. uh, 20, 20 books or 30 years ago. Uh, in retrospect, it's sort of clear to me that it has been a subject. Another one of my subjects, I suppose, is that of rootlessness or rootedness, that of deracination and belonging, and it's a little more clearly connected to my personal history. But um, writers probably don't have more than two or three major topics, and I guess the passage of time is one of mine. Okay. Universal enough. So, um, favorite form, still the novel? Um, or short fiction, or essay, or long non or sh uh, long form nonfiction like the. Uh... I'm not sure that I would say it's a favorite form. Um, I'm finding nonfiction easier to write these days, because you know if you are a, a novelist, once you've written the story of your childhood and first love, then the story of your marriage, then the story of your divorce, then the story of your professional life, um, you kind of run out of subjects um, and you have to begin to cast about you and, and look at the big bad world for something other than um, that which is contained within the borders of the self. That being so, uh, nonfiction is easier because you really do need to know um, something about your subject in order to report upon it at even brief length. So I wrote a book about the making of a great cello and the re refashioning of it. And in order to do that, I had to learn a lot about the craft of the luthier. I wrote a book about the south of France, and in order to do that, I had to live there. And uh, the trials you go yes, through. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's the hard. sacrifices you make for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just mean that in nonfiction, one is um, given a kind of head start. Um, it's certainly easier interviewing. 
nonfiction writers. Interviewing people who solely write fiction, the great temptation is where do you get your ideas, which is the worst goddamn question in the world. <laughs> so of the nonfiction writer, there's the topic in addition to the book itself. That, right. You know, and again, that research, I suppose. Is. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I want to shift the, the subject slightly or the way of addressing it. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I feel as if I sleepwalk my way through much of my life, by which I mean I sort of go through the motions, I pretend to pay attention, I um, uh, try not to fall if I'm walking straight ahead or fall asleep if I'm sitting at a table. But it's it's mostly politeness. And, and then, for reasons I can never predict, beforehand, or quite understand after the fact, then I'm wide awake. Um, then I some, then everything is is interesting to me, you know, is is clear and um, vivid. And it's those moments. I mean, aestheticians call it you know valuative time. Uh, I only saw her for an hour, but it was worth it. <laughs> you don't write in the novel about that experience, about the 10-hour drive uh, and the sleazy motel uh, on, the, on the way in which you slept. Um, you don't write about the boring experience of getting back on the train afterwards or whatever. You, you focus on the encounter. And that, that focus um, is, uh, I think, crucial both to fiction and nonfiction. I mean, we have a hundred ideas every day. Ninety-five of them are worthless. Uh, two or three of them, of the, of the remaining five, may be worth pondering for a bit before you discard them. And one, if you're lucky, might stick. Um, and so that's, I guess, the way I perceive those things that... And this is another component part of a nonfiction enterprise, or if you engage in biography, you kind of have to know that you'll still be interested two years down the pike. Hmm. Um, and there aren't that many subjects that can lay claim to that. Well, that's why we, we have that James Merrill biography over there, mm-hmm. to know that Langdon Hammer spent 13 years on and off, but still 13 years writing it is just... I've spent five years so far doing these, and, and that seems like a lot of work as as these things go. But when you talk about the um, the sleepwalking, that is part of why I do this. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's no cheating when it's... Well, it's a, it's a line from Frank O'Hara, and it's the only line of Frank O'Hara that I know. Uh-huh. Uh, the only truth comes face to face. People ask, could you do this by Skype, or could we do it over the phone? So we could, but both of us will be goofing around in the background instead of exactly looking so. at each other and not looking at our phones or anything else. Exactly That's, um, so. You know, the, um, I wonder... I don't know the author of that biography, but I wonder whether... By the end of it, he was heartily sick of his subject or was incrementally interested in him. Oh, oh that comes up during our podcast, trust me. He, <laughs> he goes into the, yeah, there's a degree of the, oh my God, it just keeps going. <laughs> I've had a few uh, authors like that who've had biographies that, that kept growing in scale and scope that they just didn't realize were going to take this much time, several mm. of whom were amateur biographers. It was their first book. They just <clears throat> didn't realize what goes into doing that. Uh, for me, like I said, I do everything by proxy, so I just get to hear about how tough all this work is, but I never have to do it myself. <laughs> like the writing, I've, I've managed to, you know, do this at a distance to, to everyone. You seem uh, pretty ease, pretty much at ease with the language, however. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the two short stories I've written in the last 25 years, and you'll say, oh, wow, Gil, you really should have developed right. some good habits, and then you might have a body of work. So. Um, but speaking of... How have students changed, or how did they change? You retired very recently, and I will point out that you're the second director of an MFA program from Bennington uh, to have been on the show this year, but uh, Sven, Sven Burkerts, oh, sure. um, who sends his regards, by the way. Right. Um, but how how you've been doing, you were teaching from 66 to a year or so ago. Precisely so. Uh, and by the way, I'm teaching a master class in Columbia this, yeah, uh, I, I this very moment, so yeah. I mean... It's a bit of a busman's holiday. Um, what, but, students, but, what were students like then versus now? You know, that's a difficult, a difficult question for me to answer because, by and large, in my teaching career, 
I taught at many schools as a as a visitor. I taught at Williams and Trinity and Skidmore and Iowa and Columbia and so on. But mostly I, I, I was affiliated with two institutions. The first was the very small and select Bennington College uh, in the southwestern corner of Vermont. And uh, next was the very large uh, University of Michigan in the southeastern corner of Michigan. And on the face of it, they couldn't be less similar. They couldn't be uh, more unlike. Um, but in fact, uh, given that I was <clears throat> principally charged with creating writing programs and, and, and having uh, uh, making young talent um, hone his skills, in fact, there wasn't that much difference. Uh, and nor was there that much difference in um, the nature of, of the confrontation. My first, and perhaps most uh, consequential student at Bennington was Brett Easton Ellis, who wrote Less Than Zero while he was there and in my class. My most recent consequential student, I suppose, is Jessamyn Ward, who perhaps next week will win the National Book Award for the second time for her novel, <clears throat> Sing, Unburied Sing. I will stop coughing soon, I promise. <laughs> you can get some more um, you need. But, and, and though they are, you know, radically different one from the other, as Aristotle tells us, you only notice the difference in those things that are essentially similar. I.e., I would compare your sweater to my shirt, but I wouldn't compare your pen to that suitcase. Um, the pen and the suitcase belong to different categories. Mm -hmm. The shirt and the sweater don't. And so, though I clearly know the difference between the work of Brett Easton Ellis and that of Jessamyn Ward and a hundred or so published authors, maybe 300 or so published authors that I've dealt with in between, what strikes me as, uh, as the through line and the similarities um, is greater. Um, because what a writing workshop consists of is a dozen or so students who take the work, the idea seriously and sit around a, a shared table and try to hone their craft. And that doesn't change, and that hasn't changed, at least for me. Hmm. And the MFA versus NYC crazy. Oh, uh, thank God you're looking befuddled about this. This is great, because in, in hipster circles around here, there's the <clears> whole, <throat> should you go to MFA or straight to New York? And Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I tend to believe in the uh, in the MFA because I think that um, the world um, is too much with us uh, and that getting and spending has to come later soon and that if you get a couple of years or ideally three years to be separated out from that enterprise, um, how fortunate you are. So um, it's a form of apprenticeship still. But it's it leaves you it, it leaves you the time to do your work. I, I think the the argument is is harder to make if you're talking about journalism school um, or even film school. I mean, there are ways that you can enter the the, the craft uh, even as a dog's body um, uh, right away and certainly early on. But a writer needs time to mature. And if an MFA project um, or program uh, provides you with that, then why the hell not? The culture does itself no harm by attending to its language. And the students themselves, it's just been, a, again, a continuity of sorts. I only ask because we're in that era of those goddamn kids are so self-entitled, they don't under... And you haven't seen particularly any issues along those lines that... Um, um, students today are somehow expecting something different from uh, from instruction than 30 years ago. I think that's a little truer of the general process of education than mm -hmm. it is of the graduate cadre who are en engaged in um, honing their uh, their skills in a in a trade. I mean, I feel as if I'm preaching uh, to the congregation 
when I'm in an MFA class. Um, I'm not need, I don't need to convince them of the virtue and the value of the enterprise, otherwise why the hell would they be there? Um, that's not quite the same thing. I mean, I also in the last years at, at Michigan taught uh, a few large lecture courses, and out of every hundred students in the room, there might have been a good 50 of them who were playing with their cell phones or, or their um, computers uh, and not taking notes. Um, so I think there is that sense of entitlement or distraction or whatever it is that one wishes to uh, charge uh, a contemporary student with, uh, I think there is a case to be made for that. There, there's less reverence for the idea of study, uh, if you will, than routinely obtained way back when. But A, I'm not sure how routinely it obtained. Um, yeah. and, kids are and, always kids. Right. Yeah. And B, I, is that you? Hmm? Oh, no, words. that's... that's ah, yeah. all right. Life in New York. <laughs> um, and I would say that uh, certainly at the University of Michigan, uh, we would take about a dozen writers of prose fiction each year, and at least ten of them were, were admirable uh, and focused and not wasteful or wasteful. I, I really admire that, that mm -hmm. cadre. On the other hand, you know, we had a thousand applicants, and so we'd yeah. have to have been dumber than we were not to get extremely good students. Now, let me ask, this whole time I've been looking over, you've got a laptop on your writing desk. Mm. A few years ago, there was an exhibition of your papers um, oh. a couple of years back, and I, I wonder about the difference from writing longhand, writing a typewriter, working on a laptop, not having... Um, visions and revisions, basically. Having a, a Word document as opposed to, you know, manuscript copy to, to be looked over. In terms of what that means as far as having papers goes, what, what was that uh, like for you, shifting to, to an electronic world? Um, again, I, I, I think that, you know, though I'm happy to talk about my particular example, it's just my particular example, it's yeah. not a general truth. And I don't think the verdict is quite in yet about whether or not we're more careful or careless because of the computer. Um, I mean, one could argue, when I was, well, for openers, as I said to you before, my handwriting is awful. So um, and if you were able to see some of those demonstrated truths in, in the uh, show of my old manuscripts, you would understand why it was a great relief when I, I turned to the typewriter. I'm a very good typist. I'm, I'm a very bad um, uh, scribe, but a very good typist. And for many, many years, um, I just go clacking at the keys. That's essentially still what I do with a computer. I have almost no technological skills beyond being able to put uh, use this as a word processor. Um, so it's the machinery that changes. I was actually just in um, <clears throat> in Madrid, uh, no, I think this was Salamanca, where there was a museum of the book, um, and uh, there were demonstration or evidences, not really of papyrus and you know the Rosetta Stone and, and the original um, uh, bamboo scrolls, uh, but also of course Gutenberg and, and Incunabula of various sorts. There's been an enormous amount of technological change. I mean, Project Gutenberg now allows sure. you to hold in, in your palm or, um, or on your iPad the contents of the British Museum and, and, and the um, public library. Um, but essentially, the act of composition is, I think, the same. It's still a function of someone trying to blacken the blank page. Um, and I wonder more with revision, though, given that you don't have to, you don't have to see it in print, uh, you know, uh, on a piece of paper to revise, if that change, if, if you've noticed that as a, a difference, given how important editing and revision has been for you. Again, as I say, I'm not sure that, that the verdict is in. Um, I, I used to be, as I said, a, a good typist, so it didn't bother me to retype a page. Um, 
and often I would do so 10, 20, 30 times, and then take scissors to them and cut and paste and what have you. That's much faster now, um, but it doesn't mean that you get tired of it quite so quickly either. Um, at a certain point, I would I would say, you know, the hell with it. Um, that's as good as I can do, and, and go on. Uh, I think some people, and I think I may be one of them, are more meticulous because of the computer rather than less so. Um, there's a great phrase, a great stanza from uh, William <coughs> Butler Yeats, who one could quote endlessly, of course, but this is from a poem of his called Adam's Curse. He says, a line will take us hours, maybe, but if it does not seem a moment's thought, our stitching and unstitching has been wrought. I really love that formulation. Um, you work on something for hours, but in order to counterfeit spontaneity, as it were. And um, if it looks too labored, uh, then it's failed. Uh, Yeats uh, rewrote that stanza quite a lot, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it comes out kind of casual. And just think how different it would be if instead of maybe he'd said, a line will take us hours, maybe. Um, but if he'd said, perhaps, or uh, possibly, or peradventure, um, you know, totally different. But that our stitching and unstitching has been naught. Um, naught is, a, is an anglicism, or in his case, more particularly an Irishism. Um, it's what we mean by nothing or zero or, or zip. Um, the Brits would say naught or nil. Um, so he means that you know, stitching it together and then cutting it apart, uh, it, it, it's not worth anything unless it looks like it's spontaneous. And I think that's the point of revision. What's so curious about it, though, and what is uh, a minor mystery of the art, is that... Um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between something that came to you the first time through more or less letter perfect and something that you worked on 15 to 20 times. Um, because uh, mediocrity is the one that resides between. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find things coming more spontaneous? Did Were you better, more receptive to spontaneity as your work progressed? Mm. Or did you find yourself more subject to revision to... Again, as you mentioned, being much more about reserve yeah. now, was it something where you... Uh... I think for me, revision is a different thing now than was the case when I was, in effect, a beginner. Um, for better or worse, I, I'm kind of an adept of language, by which I mean uh, I can write a sentence and it looks like one. Uh, I can um, write a paragraph and sort of know where the rhythms of the sentences belong and where the opposite clauses go and so on and so forth. Um, I don't need to fix the language as such quite the way I did when I was starting out and worrying over each sentence like a dog of bone. Um, so revision for me is now a, a rather larger and in some ways a harder thing. It's what the hell am I doing with this paragraph or does this scene belong? Or is there any point in that character? Um, these are larger questions uh, and uh, somewhat more obdurate. Um, when I first became a teacher, uh, well-meaning friends were, you know, were, were worried and they said, you know, there's only so much language you can have and you don't want to spend it on uh, <laughs> yeah. in the class uh, when you can have it on the page, and you'll use it up. I found actually, and I suspect this is true of other professors also, that uh, the occupational hazard of teaching is precisely the reverse, so that it's a kind of logoria, um, so that I can now say in a paragraph what used to take me a sentence, <laughs> and I can speak with an approximation of authority on a subject about which I know nothing at all. 
that was my key moment of realizing that I really am a lobbyist. Yeah. I, I was stopped at 5.15 in the morning outside a train station in Newark by a camera crew asking a question about a governmental policy that I had no background in whatsoever before my morning coffee and was nonetheless able to give them 45 seconds yeah. perfectly. I headed down to my location. A neighbor of mine texted saying, Kill, I'm watching News 1 and uh, looks like you're on TV right now. <laughs> I like to think that that was my moment of, I delivered them the perfect soundbite so they could just turn and go right back to the studio. And, and, do the <laughs> and have their own topic. Yeah. It, yep. I, I'm sure you, I mean, we know each other. At this point, I think all, we're good friends. But, 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 but I, um, I believe that. Uh, you have a, an easy way with a sentence and, uh, and a quick repartee so that um, you too are at risk of being glued. Um, and oh, it's not at risk, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I meant was that I kind of turn on the language tap and mm. out pours uh, the, the discourse so that what's gotten more and more important to me is to value language to make sure each word matters uh, and that it's not just sort of the truth daily dross. I mean, the New York Times every Sunday prints more words than I can hope to write in my lifetime. Uh, and so if I don't use the word the uh, with a slightly different emphasis and intensity than do they, then it's sort of a wasted effort. Not. One of the I would say weirdly. I don't want to say weirdly. Um, one of the most honest but difficult things for me to read in, in the, the collection was your assessment of yourself as a minor writer. Mm. Only because you've achieved a great deal, uh, at least in terms of a body of work. <clears throat> what was that that sense for you of, of reaching that conclusion or of seeing yourself or of being aware as you were starting out as a writer that you were looking at that that Olympus? Yes, you're right. Uh, that was a difficult thing to report upon. Without uh, making self-pity out of it, which you also denote in, in uh, the, the I, I do believe it's neither self-pitying nor, nor falsely modest. Um, I, what I was trying to get at is that there are two ways of looking at a career. One is in comparative and the other is in absolute terms. In comparative terms, of course, um, I and really any other writer I know is always jockeying for position and being um, proud of the recent uh, you know, piece of praise or irritated that it wasn't forthcoming and comparing your royalty statements uh, uh, with the guy next door and saying, you know, I'm better than he is or she's gotten more attention than I did, and all of that, that sort of elbowing um, stuff. Uh, you can tell uh, from the way I'm talking about it that um, it, it wearies me, and I'm not very good at it anymore, even if I ever was. But those are comparative rankings, uh, and, uh, and they... They fade um, with time. They don't um, come back to haunt you, I would hope. Um, in absolute terms, uh, I feel like I've been treated far better than I deserve. Uh, I mean, you need only look at Tolstoy or Shakespeare, and uh, you recognize that you're a minor writer. Um, or you should recognize that, and those who don't are, are self-deluded. Um, which is so, a key aspect of being a writer, but, but go on. Yeah, maybe. What I'm trying to say is that, in fact, in, in most people's view, my career has been a wildly successful and a fortunate one, and I've been perhaps um, praised uh, more than I deserve, and certainly have been uh, you know, constantly published, constantly employed, constantly uh, engaged. So I have nothing to complain about, uh, even though the impulse uh, is that of, of complaint. But I've dropped a, a, a fair number of names uh, at you in the course of this hour. 
um, uh, Tolstoy, Shakespeare most recently, uh, Trollope and Yeats uh, uh, a little before. I, I can't pretend that I'm anything other than a pygmy to those uh, giants, and I don't think, think there's much point in doing so. Mm -hmm. So, but is um, that what would make one minor in this day and age? Are you considering yourself solely measured against that pantheon? Or do you... Well, in terms of the, of the present day and age, it's also true that I'm not um, on everybody's short list for, for the Nobel Prize or, or long list for this year's National Book Award or, any, or, or Booker or anything like that. I have a, a position off of the edge of things um, and I'm trying to rest content with that. When I recorded with John Crowley, we've done two of these now. Mm -hmm. um, he did lament the, and I, I used to know Paul West, and we, we had the, the same yeah. thing, being a writer's writer, right. and what that means in terms of critics and, and one's commercial It's, it's damning with faint praise, and it's praise that I've received. Yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> you don't say it explicitly in this, but yeah, Crowley had that with himself, and yeah. just apparently I'm a writer's writer. I still need someone to read what I write, but yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I, I, I wrote a book uh, some years ago called Group Portrait um, about a constellation of writers uh, who lived in England in, at 19, in 1900, and you'll know their names, Joseph Conrad, uh, Henry James, Stephen Crane, H.G. Wells, Ford Maddox Ford, etc., etc. And as part of the research for that book, I looked at um, the bestseller lists from 1900 to 1910 uh, in England, uh, and none of them came even remotely close to inclusion. In fact, I mean, this is my business. I should know something about it. The only two authors I recognized were the Baroness Orgsy, who uh, published a book called The Scarlet Pimpernel, which uh, did very well then and is still doing well, and Edgar Rice Burroughs, who, who began his Tarzan sequence. Uh, the other 150 authors or so uh, had names that meant literally nothing to me. And this is at the time when James was writing The Ambassadors and Conrad was writing Lord Jim and Stephen, etc. So one can delude oneself or perhaps comfort oneself with the notion that the verdict ain't in and that uh, long years hence the world will, will read uh, and reread the years with admiration. Um, that is a self-comforting delusion, and I try not to engage in it over much. But I, I do think that it's important to, to keep a longer view. Have you been happy with your career? Uh, and I think that ties into the question, are you happy with your life, children going into... Well, actually, that's another question. Are you happy that your children went into the family business for a while? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that my children are happy. <laughs> um, and I'm button-busting proud of both my daughters, their husbands, their progeny. Yes, I'm a very fortunate fellow. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I think in some ways the story of my life was kind of predicated before it began because my family uh, were German Jews who um, knew each other glancingly in, in Germany and fled Hitler and met again uh, separately in England and married there. That's where I was born. Um, and at a certain point in the Blitzkrieg, uh, when uh, Hitler decided that he wanted to turn his attention to Russia and not to um, continue with the planned invasion of England, my mother, who was a very smart woman, uh, turned to my father and said, he's made a mistake. We may survive. Mm -hmm. Let's have another child. I had an older brother already. Um, or he was there. And I became his younger brother. Um, anyway, uh, the reason I say, tell you all this, uh, it's, it's sort of family myth or personally incorporated uh, myth of poesis, I guess, but um, that was a great gamble that my parents took because on balance to be German Jews in London when Hitler was invading was to have a very short life expectancy. My father died at 98. Uh, I'm nowhere near there yet, but I have some hopes of attaining something like it. Um, and for the vast bulk of 
uh, of my life. I've been a happy man. Um, so uh, I feel that all these things are, are gambles worth the taking. And yes, um, I'm, I mean, it, it's fatuous to say you're contented with your career. I obviously want more. Uh, it's the sort of disease that a writer calls health to think that everything they've written is rotten and everything they're about to write is terrific. So I keep getting up in the morning and saying, what next? What now? But that's not the same thing as saying that I'm disappointed with what went before. Hmm. Let me ask about the family question. How important is Jewishness <clears throat> to you? And I, I do ask, I believe your older brother is a doctor or was a doctor. He is a doctor. Um, and did that remove the pressure because you had the mother, <laughs> because my son, the doctor, so, so that you and your younger brother could go off and have careers that you, you wanted? Uh, that you know that my son, the doctor, is drowning. Yes. You've, you've heard that one. Okay. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, our mother was, uh, was fiercely uh, ambitious for her children. Um, but her particular form of ambition was that she would be educated. I think she would have been far more pleased to know that each of her three sons were professors in American universities um, than to know the particular nature of our career. She died relatively early on, and, but she was very proud of my first few books and, and certainly was proud of my older brother. And, and wildly hopeful about the wildly successful career of my younger brother. Um, but I don't, think, uh, I don't think I was permitted to be an artist because I had a brother who was already a doctor. <laughs> it wasn't quite that simple. In fact, my father, who was a businessman, was a, a sort of failed artist, or at least a uh, an artist without much uh, recognition, and he was an almost ideal um, uh, elder f figure for me because he didn't object to the fact that I didn't go into the family business. He, he was sort of behind the idea that I do something um, closer to my heart's desire. Um, the question you asked about Jewishness uh, is a little more complicated. I'm a Jew only uh, in terms of um, the pride of position, meaning if anybody questions um, yeah. one's being Jewish or is anti-Semitic, then I stand up and shout. But I'm not a practicing Jew or a knowledgeable one or um, uh, an engaged um, believer in, in, in any sort. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a Jew by history and identity rather than daily practice. A cultural Jew, although you, yeah. you don't seem to demonstrate the neurosis that, that tends to characterize <laughs> us here. Uh, potentially you were you know, inoculated against that in, in the UK. Yeah, when, when that, that may have been so. You know. right. um, has that ever been a, a issue? I know Michigan also had some um, clan issues once mm. upon a time, although that, it's a big state, and I'm sure uh, Ann Arbor wasn't exactly a, a focal point. No, Ann Arbor was not a hotbed of yeah. uh, anti-Semitism, hardly. And in fact, it was one of the, uh, together with Wisconsin, I think, it was one of the places that, that aspirant Jews could go to study in, mm. in, the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and, uh, well, for openers, um, foolishly enough, most people don't think of Del Banco as a Jewish name. Uh, it is, as of I course. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. Then you read me, and you found out. Yeah. Uh, it is, of course. It means of the bank, mm -hmm. um, which is to say, my family were money lenders way back when. It was way back when. It was the 16th century in Italy, um, and um, but I'm I'm not routinely. Uh, I'm more routinely um, mistaken for an Italian. That I am taken for a Jew. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. I guess the last question: What do you consider home? Um, you got New England. You got Michigan. You've got here. You've got deracination as your your underlying thread. Well, when deracination is your underlying thread, that is um, a uh, it, it changes the terms of the question a little bit. I'm not sure this is true for other people, but it certainly is 
the case for me that having been born elsewhere and having spent quite a bit of time outside the country and just literally returned from Spain, I've been to France and Italy within the year, um, uh, the idea of deep-rooted, um, necessary home, ancestral uh, space is a little different. Uh, one tends to be lateral uh, rather than vertical in terms of um, placement. Uh, so I don't feel that home is a superimposed uh, geographical entity. I think it's much more an elected one. And for me, elected home has been New England, really. Uh, I loved the mountains of Vermont. I love Cape Cod, where we spend much of our time. Uh, and that's home. But to be fatuous and serious at the same time, home is where the heart is. And the heart is with my wife and children and their children. And therefore, in a heartbeat, I would um, be with them rather than elsewhere alone. Uh, there are many reasons these days to want to leave the country, but if you have um, your lifelong partner and your family in it, then that's not a choice. Hmm. Real last question. Did you feel you were cheating in lastingness when you put in Lampedusa? And I'm ecstatic that you put him mm. in. He, yeah, put, he didn't live to 70. He only had the one book. It's one of my favorite novels of all time, The Leopard. Did, did you kind of feel like you were tweaking things just to make sure uh, you could get in a sketch of... of, of yes, uh, I did. Um, and I think I explained uh, it a little yeah. um, and tried to justify that choice. I mean, for me, it was more the subset of, uh, of, of, him, of achievement that I wanted to write about. It was the idea of improving with age. Uh, Lampedusa was essentially a, a dilettante uh, and a, um, a self-abnegating, self-denigrating presence. Um, and I'm not sure of this, but rumor says that uh, in his late 40s, he had a cousin who won a prize for writing poetry, and he looked around and said, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm as good as he is, and I'll, uh, I'll undertake to, to write some prose. Um, he'd been keeping copious notes and notebooks uh, before that. But in fact, his first and only uh, finished novel came at the end of his life. And so uh, the fact that he wasn't 70 didn't seem so relevant to me. He was an example of somebody who, whose artistic uh, expressiveness increased over age and time rather than diminished. And it is a great novel, and I was greatly um, fortunate to be able to include it. <laughs> because it's one that, um, and I've, I've talked about it on the show before, it was the first time in years that I finished a novel. I, I had it on my shelf for 10 years before I read it. Read it in my early 40s, realized... I couldn't have read this in my early 30s. And the moment I finished it, started over again from the beginning. And, Excellent. And, yeah. Excellent. Um, actually, one more before course, I let you go. Of course. Um, books that got better? Books that you hated once upon a time mm. that uh, somehow they got better as you got older? There's that wonderful line from Mark Twain. I, I can only paraphrase it about... Um, and I'm not even sure it's from Mark Twain. He gets the credit for every bon mot that isn't described to Oscar Wilde. Uh, he said something to the effect of, you know, uh, when I was 18, my father was a fool. When I was 21, he was a wise man. It was impressive to see how much he'd learned. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, there are books that get better uh, with time, yes. Um, actually, the novel I've just finished a draft of is sort of a version of Buddenbrooks, the first novel by Thomas Mann. Mm -hmm. And um, I reread that and found it more compelling this time through than I had way back when I read it as a boy. Um, the Quartz of Sonata by Tolstoy uh, looks uh, more
more fierce and fearsome now than it did when I first looked at it. There are many such. Um, the reverse is more usually the case. Yeah, we though. overrate things in yeah. our youth that, right. that turn out terrible. But I, I do wonder about those ones that uh, somehow manage to get better when mm. you reopen them mm. uh, and what things you need to be older to, to get. So I will let you get back to it. Nicholas Del Banco, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memory Show. What a pleasure it has been to be with you and what a series of acute questions you asked. So. And that was Nicholas Del Banco. His website is nicholasdelbanco.com, which is N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-D-E-L-B-A-N-C-O.com. And his new collection, like I said, is called Curiouser and Curiouser Essays from Mad Creek Books, a division of Ohio State Press. I read that and his three previous books to prep for this, like I said, and I'm really looking forward to reading more of his body of work. And... If I do end up writing anything, you have him to thank, or or blame. I have not sent him my short stories yet, as we talk about during this episode, um, because I'm nuts. We'll just leave it at that. Oh, and remember, if you're listening to this episode when it comes out, Nicholas will be reading from Curiouser and Curiouser and doing Q&A at Book Culture on Wednesday, November 15th, 2017, duh, at 7 p.m. And that's at 536 West 112th Street, which I think is 112th and Broadway in New York. Now, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Nicholas, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode of that went up last week, and it's got extra material from a whole bunch of guests from last quarter. Uh, Howard Chaikin, Joyce Farmer, Ben Schwartz, Ellen Forney, Ellen Datlow, Matt Ruff, Patty Farmer, Sven Burkertz, Gordon Van Gelder, Kathy Bidas, John Clute, Mimi, Pan, Mimi Pond, sorry, and Matt Worker. So you can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. And there are all sorts of goals and goodies in addition to the, the podcast, uh, the patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, the ebooks that I will someday get around to launching, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at Nicholas's apartment in New York City, uh, so that was like 10 bucks at the GW, uh, $30 for parking, and then a 20-block walk each way because that's how I roll or, or walk. Um, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, parking, etc., or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it and you're glad that I'm out here doing this, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod, where you can make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wildey Minozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Les Camella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memory Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Oh, and if you're in Mississauga, Ontario on Wednesday, please go to the FarmEd Manufacturing and Outsourcing Conference and you'll see me give the keynote presentation. I'm looking forward to whatever the hell I end up talking about. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Israeli author Eshkol Nivo and a bonus segment with British comics publisher Paul Gravett. Till next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes, our RSS feed, and our email sign-up at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. 
You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMS Pod, at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for the podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>